Grand Liquid Forum. I am May, and today we'll be talking about ovarian cancer. While we are not happy that some of these illnesses exist, we all know how important it is to create awareness and let people know what they're dealing with, how to manage it, and if it can be prevented. When we come back from this break, we'll meet our guest and go straight into the conversation. Stay with us. Welcome back. This is Catholic Faith Forum. I am May, and we're talking about ovarian cancer. And I'm here with a very special guest in the house. He's Dr. Ephraim Ohazurike. He's a consultant gynecologist at Lagos University Teaching Hospital. You're very welcome, sir. Thank you very much. We're well, happy to have you here. Yeah, thank how you. Is, I, I can't imagine how your job is, actually. You know, the first time I heard of male gynecology, I was like, how are men in this business? How is it for you? Do you well, ever get shocked? It's like, yeah, it's like every other job. You wake up, go to work, come back. You don't feel okay. weird that you're, you're a woman doctor, let me put it that way. Nothing. <laughs> okay, that's yeah. interesting. I'm actually very fascinated by that um, aspect of medicine. Okay, so we're talking about ovarian cancer today, yeah. which is something that a lot of people don't like talking about most of the time because it's particular to women only. So what is ovarian cancer? Well, I will start by asking or rephrasing the question. Okay. What is cancer? So All starting right. from the basis. Yes, yeah, so okay. cancer is like having an abnormal um, growth of cells. Mm -hmm. All right. Normally, I mean, from our old level biology, we know that cells divide. Yes. And that's how human human grow. Mm -hmm. All right. But in cancer, cells divide without any restriction. Abnormally. So they just continue to divide and divide and divide, and that's what cancer is actually. And then I'm um, talking about ovarian cancer. Yes. Cancers are named after this organ of origin. That they, they are, they yeah, so if you, like you have liver cancer, you mm -hmm. have lung cancer. So if it's originating from the ovary, then you say it's ovarian, ovarian cancer. Ovarian cancer, okay. Yes. So how is ovarian cancer detected? And what are the symptoms to look out for? Yes, I'm actually, um, ovarian cancer is called a silent killer. Wow. Um, globally. All right. Um, globally, it's about the commonness killer. I mean, or, I mean, of women. Or no, means of women. Gynecological um, um, illnesses. Illnesses. Yes. yes. When you talk about commonness uh, breast um, killer, I mean cancer killers in women. We'll be talking about breast, but gynecological. Now you're talking yes. about ovarian cancer. All right. So the sad part of it is that most times. He, 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 people don't present until in advanced stage. More than 80% wow. of these women present in stage 3, stage 4. That's really scary. Yes. So the problem actually is the fact that most of his symptoms at the early stage are very, very non-specific. So you see women go to hospital for other conditions, whereas they have something else ovarian like cancer and nobody is looking at it because... I it mean, doesn't show. Yes. Okay, so if it's so difficult to spot, how is ovarian cancer then diagnosed? Well, um, diagnosis will depend on, of course, this woman will come to the hospital. You have to take your history. Okay. All right. And then after taking the history, you examine the woman and then you request for some investigation. So in the history, they tell you that maybe they notice that their tummy is getting swollen. Um, they don't eat well, or okay. when they eat, they feel full on time. They tend to have, um, um, they feel full on time. They call it bloating. Yes. yes. And then when you examine them, you can feel that there is a swelling there. And then, of course, when you do your imaging tests, like maybe ultrasound, CT scan, mm -hmm. MRI, you see the... That there's something the, yeah, growing see, there. Yes. And then, of course, to be able to go help you in making diagnosis there are what um um some things that there are some um substances that cancers tend to produce that we call tumor markers oh. that we have to also check because not all growth is cancer uh, cancerous, yes. all right so we have to check tumor markers tumor markers then help us to say okay most likely this is mm, but what if you don't suspect cancer? that it's cancer you don't you don't carry out those kind if of if you do yes that's where the problem is oh, and you right? say it doesn't so, show symptoms yes so somebody doesn't feel well mm. goes to the hospital and the person who is saying is not suspecting so keeps treating you for something else all right and that is a common 
we have a recurring decima when it comes to ovarian cancer. Oh, that's really sad. So, yeah. are there different types of ovarian cancer? Yeah, there are different types of ovarian cancer. Now, the okay. ovary has different type of cells. All right. So, the covering of the ovary is called the epithelium. All right. Mm -hmm. Then you have the part of the ovary that produces the egg. That's what we call germ cell. Then around the, I mean, within the covering and then with around the germ cell there are what we call stroma cells okay so cancer can arise from these different Depends. cellular lines all right the commonness that we tend to have is the epithelial kind of cancer all right and then following that is the um i mean both of them go together anyway the um, str stroma cell and then the germ cell Okay. So we tend to see the germ cell in younger women, women who um like what still age in their, I mean you can see I mean, I've operated the six year old, the four oh year old. Oh my god. Yes. That's so you see it young. in children, people that are yet to start seeing their period. Once you see cancer in children, I'm very ovarian tumor in children, you're thinking of germ cell. But you don't have you hardly see them in older, older women, women, women who are postmenopausal because they've used up most of their um yes. gem cells of course yeah they're not producing eggs they're anymore. not producing oh, eggs this anymore. is really scary well when we come back from this short break we'll find out the different stages of cancer and who are most at risk of contacting it stay with us welcome back this is catholic faith forum i'm may and i'm here with dr ife mohazurike and we're talking about ovarian cancer and he just told us how it can be diagnosed so I, I read somewhere that one in 78 women will be diagnosed with ovarian cancer in their lifetime. Is this correct? Yes. Um, well, unfortunately, in this part of the world, we don't have uh, data. Proper really. data we collection. Don't have proper data. Yes. yes. So, but yes, if you go outside of this country where they keep data, where they have proper registry, mm -hmm. yes, you can come to that conclusion. So it's possible that a lot of women are going through it and we don't even know because yes. they're just suddenly yes. suffering it. Yes. Oh, that's so scary. Okay, so what are the different stages of ovarian cancer? So um, when you talk about cancer stages, generally there are four of them, stage yes. one to four. So mm -hmm. stage one means that the cancer is limited to the organ. All right, stage two means that it's affecting structures around. Mm -hmm. Stage three means that it's gone a little further. Maybe you know, uh, uh, the ovary is a pelvic organ. Maybe it's gone to the abdomen. Okay, and then stage four already. Is, yes, stage four is distant metastasis. Can it be treated at any of these stages? Well, there is treatment at every stage, but okay. the question is, can you achieve cure? Can we? All right, so um, cure at stage three and four, cure is, I mean, in fact, we want some stage two. Cure is far-fetched. Wow. All right, so at best, you palliate. I mean, you give them palliative treatment. The question Sorry, is how to, long... I have to find out what that means. Yes, palliative treatment is actually treatment that you give to people who are ill, especially cancer patients, mm. but your aim is not cure. Your aim help. is to oh. help them, make them pain-free, um, I mean, give, let them be comfortable, even oh. though we know that at some point they're going to die. Reduce some of the pain and just make them yes, be comfortable, we know that least comfortable enough. Yes, as we know they're going to die. And then at, the, at that point in time, what we'll be talking about will not be... Uh, whether we are able to achieve cure or not. What we're going to be talking about is how long did how they to live for? Their life. How long did they live for after? Like somebody with, I mean, people who have stage four. Now, I mean, roughly about 15% of them can live up to five years in the best of centers. Wow. Yes. Whew. This is so, it's a bit depressing, but it's something that we should talk about because I know people need to hear about these things because yes. we don't talk about it enough. So, what is the greatest risk? risk factor you know for ovarian cancer well um the greatest risk factor for ovarian cancer is um familial i mean it's, um when you have family history of ovarian cancer yes but it's important to say that um less than five percent of cancers are actually familiar and when we say familial again it's also important to say that not all familiar cancers are inherited Okay. Some familiar cancer are actually environmental. Like, for instance, if you live in a house where people smoke a heavily, mm. all right, yes, Second there smoke. could be familiar cancer there. It's just environment. That environment, yes, is potentiating it. But 5% will inherit it. So we're talking about 
um, families where you have um, some genetic mutations like um, BRCA1, BRCA2 gene mutation. Mm, these terms are very heavy. Yes, BRCA, BRCA gene is actually a tumor suppressor gene. I mean, okay. it does not, it tends to suppress tumor growth. But when it is mutated, all right, it's not able to perform that function. The way it should. Yes, so it can be transmitted from parents to their progeny. So are you saying that ovarian cancer is hereditary? Some of it, less okay. than five percent of it, may be hereditary. But the fact is that um, somebody can inherit BRCA gene from the parent, yes. and the person will be the first to show the disease, to express the disease. Oh, Do you get it? Yeah. Yes. So that's why if you go to advanced countries, you go to I mean developed countries. Yeah. Once someone presents with ovarian or breast cancer they will test for BRCA gene. So once BRCA gene is positive, then they will have to turn to the family. Say, okay, who is there? Who is there? I mean, a very good example that pro you probably know is Angelina Jolie. Yes. Who had to remove her ovaries and remove her breasts because her mother had BRCA1 gene. BRCA1 gene mutation makes you 70% at risk of developing breast cancer or 45% risk of developing ovarian cancer okay. so she completed her family size she quietly removed the organs but is there a way to go test for these things even if you're not showing any symptoms or anything well it is not advised i mean it's not advised for you to go and test if if you don't have a risk factor all right and what are the risk factor for instance if you have um if you have two people in in, in a family coming down with breast and ovarian. Okay. All right. Or you have male, male coming down with um, breast cancer in the family. All right. And then if you have, um, um, it's, uh, in a family, you have somebody coming down with breast, I mean, ovarian and then um, colon. Do you get it? So, yes, we can say maybe you should you test for test. some of these genetic tests. But if you don't do have of any of those testing. If you don't have it, there's no need. Yes, there's no need because for you to be able to get one person, you will need to test several people. So oh. it's not going to be economically viable. Okay, so let's take a short break here. And when we come back, we'll find out if there are ways ovarian cancer can be prevented. Stay with us. Welcome back. This is Catholic Faith Forum, and I'm here with Dr. Ife Mohazirike, and we're still talking about ovarian cancer. Sorry, I'm a bit mellow because it's just very heartbreaking that this is one of the cancers that goes undetected in most people. It's sad that people can live their lives without knowing they have it till it actually gets to a very risky stage, and that's what you're telling me now. So, are there ways that it can be prevented? Yes. Um, the fact is that you cannot... There is no um, foolproof, casting good way of preventing Ovarian this disease. Cancer. All right, but just as we we're talking earlier, you ask about um, um, what are the risk factors. Of course, we we'll talk about hereditary. Mm -hmm. With the, the other, there are other ways. I mean, low parity. Low parity means that people who have not had children could be at risk. People who didn't breastfeed could also be at oh, risk. Oh wow! Yes. Now, if you do this, like you have children, mm -hmm. you breastfeed, you, you breastfed, mm -hmm. all right, you could reduce your risk. It doesn't take it away. And of course, just like we also talked about Angelina Jolie, that had to go and remove her breast. And yeah, if you so have a genetic risk, well. if you have a genetic risk, you can go and remove your ovaries and your, I mean, your ovaries. And then, um, of course, weight loss. I mean, obesity has been implicated in virtually all manners of disease. All right, okay. weight loss. So it's also of, a factor. Yes, use of oral contraceptive pill has also been, um, I mean, talked about. Yes, all right, now, the fact is that, you know, just like I said, ovarian cancer can occur at any of the cellular levels that I mentioned earlier. And then um, for the epithelia, which is the commonness, which constitutes about 90, almost 95% of ovarian cancer 95. that you tend to see more in elderly women. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, women see their period and they ovulate. Once they ovulate, there is a break in the epithelium and then there is a repair. 
So every month there's a break, repair, repair. break, repair, break, mm -hmm. repair. So in the course of breaking and, and repair, sometimes you can have some abnormality. Oh. All right. And then that can trigger. So when um, a woman gets pregnant, she's not ovulating. Do you get For it? that whole period. For yes. that whole period. When she's breastfeeding, sometimes too, she's not she's ovulating. Not so her body so, gets to heal in a way. So, yes. Yeah, so that kind of prevents that process of breaking and, and repairing. repairing and then that risk of it going abnormal. Okay. You mentioned just now, okay, about the fertility drugs. Yeah, I actually read it somewhere that it, taking fertility drugs actually increases women's risk of ovarian cancer. Yes. It, theoretically, do you get it? When you take fertility drug, you have sometimes multiple eggs form. That means you have multiple breaks mm -hmm. and then multiple repairs and stuff like that. Theoretically, yes, it could it made sense. But research-wise, people have not been able to associate use of fertility drug to um, development of ovarian cancer. But okay. theoretically, it makes sense. Because we know that there has to be break and repair in the process of ovulation, and then, um, um, and and then um, that's in the course of the menstrual yes. cycle. Yes. Okay. So, what advice can you give to like young people like me out there who are just here looking, thinking about this thing? I'm like, oh my god, how can I, how can I live my life in a way that I don't have to experience these things at all? What can we do? Well, for me, just live healthy. That's that's the basic thing. Live healthy. All right? Eat healthy. Be active, basically. Okay. Yes. And then if you have a genetic risk, if somebody in your family has, has it. it and things like that, yes, I mean, you can, I mean, look in. Yeah, but basically, just live healthy. Okay. Ovarian cancer is one of the cancers that affect only women. And due to the fact that it goes mostly undetected till it gets to its later stages, we really need to pay attention to our bodies and live healthier lives. Stay healthy, eat healthy, as you said, live healthy lives and you'll be fine. Let's go over to Collins for today's episode of Know Your Faith. Stay with us. Thank you very much, May. Hello and welcome to another episode of Know Your Faith series. I'm Collins and today we'll be talking about the mystery of the Assumption. Now, the Assumption is one of the four dogmas of our Blessed Virgin Mary and it is a feast celebrated on the 15th of August. It was proclaimed by Pope Pius XII on November 1st, 1950. And it's a celebration, like I said, that is uh, celebrated every year on the 15th of August. Pope Francis put it this way, he said, the Assumption is a time when the holy faithful people of God express with joy their veneration of the Virgin Mother. They do so in the common liturgy and also in a thousand different ways of piety. And thus, the prophecy of Mary herself comes true. All generations shall call me blessed. And we find this in Luke chapter one, verse 48. So, even the CCC puts it this way, it says that the Blessed Virgin Mary, having completed the course of her earthly life, was assumed body and soul into heavenly glory and exalted by the Lord as queen over all things. Now, this dogma is intricately related to another one of the dogmas, Immaculate Conception, which is basically stated that Mary was born without original sin. So she was born sinless. So it only makes sense that her body does not stay here on earth and rot. So it makes sense that being the mother of God, Eutychus, she's carried up both body and soul into heaven. So Mary, at the end of her earthly life, being completely free from sin as she was, did not decay of her earthly body which is fitting for the mother of God. So by virtue of her immaculate conception, she was chosen by God to become the queen of heaven and earth. Now, while the assumption of Mary is peculiar to her, the faith upon or her grace is open to everyone. So this is why we believe that when Christ comes again, he will be able to you know, raise both the living and the dead. So we, still, we can still tap from this grace that Mary already has received. As long as we say this every day on Sunday in the creed, 
but we believe that Jesus will come again to raise the living and the dead. So that is for today, guys. I hope you've been able to understand the mysteries of the assumption. There are three other dogmas, and on another episode of Know Your Faith series, we'll be focusing on each and every one of them. That is for today, guys. Thank you so much for having me, and back to you, May. Welcome back. Thank you very much, Collins, for that episode on the mystery of assumption. Our saint of the week is Saint Peregrine Laziosi. He's the patron saint of cancer patients. Peregrine Laziosi was born in 1265 and died in 1345. He was born in Forli, Italy, the only son of well-to-do parents. In his teens, he joined his, the enemies of the Pope in his hometown and soon became a ringleader of rebels. Pope Martin IV had placed Forli under a spiritual interdict, which closed churches in the city, hoping to bring its citizens to their senses. That failing, he sent Philip Benizi of the Order of Servites, Servants of Mary, as his personal ambassador to try to bring peace to the angry rebels. No welcome mat was spread for the papal delegates. While addressing crowds of malcontents one day, he was dragged off the rostrum, beaten with clubs and pelted with rocks. Peregrine knocked him down with a vicious blow to the face. Moments after, stricken with remorse, the youth cast himself at the feet of the bruised and bleeding priest and asked for his forgiveness, which was granted with a smile. Peregrine became a staunch champion of Philip Benizi. He headed Philip's suggestion and often prayed in Our Lady's Chapel in the cathedral. While kneeling there, he had a vision of the Blessed Mother holding in her hands a black habit like the one the Servites wore. Go to Siena, Mary told the astonished Peregrine. There you will find a devout men who call themselves my servants. Attach yourself to them. The Servites gave him a warm welcome. He was clothed ceremoniously in religious habit by Philip Benizi himself. One of Peregrine's slogans as a Servite may well have been, better today than yesterday, better tomorrow than today. Daily, he sought to become a more fervent religious man. To atone for his past misdeeds, he treated himself harshly and worked hard for the poor and afflicted. People took to calling him the angel of good counsel. So grateful were they for his wise advice so freely given. After being ordained a priest, he went to Forli to found a Servite monastery. A few years later, a cancerous growth appeared on his right foot. It was so painful that he finally agreed with the surgeon who wanted to amputate it. The night before the scheduled surgery, Peregrine spent hours in prayer. Then he dozed off and dreamt that Christ was touching him and healing his foot. The thrill of it woke him. In the dim moonlight, he saw that his foot, carefully bandaged a few hours earlier, was completely healed. The fallen nurses appreciated him still more after learning of the miraculous cure. When they were sick, they appealed to his prayers. Some were cured when he whispered Jesus into their ears. The church has since appointed him patron of persons with cancer, foot ailments, or any incurable disease. Peregrine died on May 1, 1345, and was ranked with the saints in 1726. Thousands of clients pay him special honor on May 1st each year. I certainly unite my voice with theirs. Thank you for being with us on the show today. Thank you very much, Dr. Thank Ephraim. you very much. It was a very interesting and insightful conversation, even though it scared me a little bit because <laughs> illnesses are not something that we actually enjoy talking about. Yeah. If you want to sponsor this show, please feel free to reach out to us on our social media platforms at CFF on TV or check out our website, www.dominicamedia.com.ng. Also, feel free to send your suggestions, questions, inquiries, to our social media platforms at CFF on TV, and we'll definitely get back to you. Also, subscribe to our YouTube channel, Dominican Media Presents, and we'll put up episodes of the show and other amazing content, and you'll definitely enjoy it. Don't forget to join us every Tuesday at 7 p.m. on Twitter for the CFF chatroom with the hashtag CFF chatroom. And our question for the, this Tuesday is What are some cancer facts that astound you? Hmm. Interesting one, right? I can't wait to see you there on Tuesday at 7 p.m. Okay, till next time, keep being saints in, in jeans, jeans and, and shirts. shirts.